right, let's get started. Welcome. I'm very happy to introduce my colleague, Jonas Helgert. Uh, Jonas is uh, Associate Senior Lecturer for the Department of Economic History at the Center for Economic Demography at Lund University. Uh, he's also a research associate at NPC. In general, his work um, focuses on the impact of early life, uh, health, and uh, economic resources on later life, health, and economic resources. Uh, he's now involved here on several projects that intellectually are on those themes, but that one way or another involve record linkage. Um, he is um, involved in a project to link uh, 1900, 10, and 20 children observed in 1900, 10, and 20 to the, their records in 1940, census, and then to mortality records. He's involved in another project to link uh, the 1940 census to several modern aging surveys. Um, and he is increasingly involved in Ithams MLP, which is the effort to link the 1850 through 1940 US censuses. Um, so you may see him about doing all of those things, and he may be drinking from his new uh, coffee mug. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So this is something uh, completely different um, on uh, the sociodemographic outcomes of children of divorce and, and uh, more specifically about on, on the consequences of step family formation um, in contemporary Scandinavia. And this is a uh, joint work with uh, a postdoc in Lund, Anna Teguni Mataka. Um, and this is kind of what I've been working on when uh, I'm working uh, on the linkage stuff. So uh, a point of departure, or the, this is um, essentially a presentation about a project. Uh, that was funded recently uh, about, uh, from the Swedish Research Council. Uh, it's a three-year research project into the consequences of experiencing the introduction of step-parents on several different outcomes um, uh, among the children exposed. Um, we're going to be looking at school performance and school choice, uh, early adulthood demographic outcomes, such as uh, the, the partner choice of the, ki the kids, uh, their decision to get married, their decision to have kids themselves. Uh, and we're also going to be looking at health outcomes. Um, the a particular focus on, uh, of the project is to explore how differences across characteristics uh, of the step parents, uh, as well as uh, the timing and duration of exposure to step parents, influences these different outcomes. And I will come back to this later. This is something that we're going to be uh, doing, or that, that we are doing, using uh, Swedish and Danish uh, longitudinal administrative register data. So uh, an overarching point of departure here is that um, the generation and persistence of inequalities across generations is really at the core of the social science literature. If you look at economics literature or the sociology literature, this is really a core topic. Um, and I think that it's fair to say that few factors uh, have been so comprehensively studied and have been shown to be valid across context and across time uh, than the fact that the individual's background matters, right? Um, you know, you look at intergenerational income mobility, intergenerational transmission of occupational status or educational attainment or health. These things show, have shown to have a strong intergenerational component, all right? Looking at income, for example, I think the literature would suggest that, well, depending on the country that you look at, but between like 20% or 40% of, of um, your father's advantage or disadvantage will be transmitted to the subsequent generation. Um, one could, of course, say that a part of this transmission of status or whatever kind of outcome we're looking at um, is linked to genes, of course. Uh, but all these factors or all these outcomes, I think, have been comprehensively shown to be transmitted across generations net of genes. So there's something else that's being transmitted. Um, these intergenerational models that I'm talking about typically focus on the role of biological parents in influencing the outcomes of the children. Um, along with the rise in divorce, separation, and stepfamily formation, um, I think it's fair to say that, or we know that a considerable share of children will be exposed to various or alternative constellations or family constellations 
during their upbringing. It may be that they're exposed to a stepmother or stepfather or only to divorce. But regardless, all these things, uh, it's fair to assume that they will also influence the outcomes of the children. Um, so the models that you typically see in these intergenerational studies um, used to explain children's outcomes, looking at the characteristics of the parents, be it the age of the parents, the country of origin of the parents, the educational attainment of the parents, um, as well as other familial characteristics, such as uh, the number of siblings, the number of older siblings, whether the person is the first child or the last child, and things like this. Um, so models that only focus on the biological parents and biological siblings, I think it's fair to say that these models are becoming increasingly irrelevant, mm -hmm. given what we're seeing across uh, developed countries today. So turning to some the data that we have on the prevalence of, of step families, this is a common phenomenon not only in, in Sweden and or Scandinavia that we're studying in this project, but across other countries as well, such as the United States. Um, some data that, was, that I was able to find suggest that over 40% of marriages will end in divorce uh, within 15 years. And a large proportion of the individuals that end up divorcing will go on to meet someone new. Um, that may be a transition that involves marriage, or it may be a transition that just involves cohabitation or any other form of serious relationship. These data that exists are a little bit problematic uh, because they only because the data that we typically have are on marital unions, and there's less reliable data on other forms of family constellations. Um, so, for example, where when data for the U.S. say that the divorce rates are uh, declining, that's partly a, a function of there being fewer marriages. And a lot of people choose to cohabit instead of marriage, instead of marry, and, and that the dissolution of these cohabitations are never actually recorded. So this is a, a, a very common thing, which comes as a surprise to no one. So the theoretical framework that we have here um, is basically a very similar, or a very simple, framework. And uh, a model that, is, that, that I like personally, and I think makes a lot of sense, um, was uh, introduced in a demography article um, on multi-generational um, um, social mobility, uh, where they focus on, where Zheng and Xi focus on three different pathways of multi-generational influence, but which could also be um, modified to, to be a, a two a, 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 a an intergenerational influence. So focusing on biological, economic, and socio-emotional pathways of influence. Now naturally, when we're talking about step-parents, um, so individuals who are biologically unrelated to the kids that we're examining, focusing on a biological pathway, of course, makes no sense. Um, economic and socio-emotional pathways, however, however, make more sense. Um, an individual uh, or a step-parent who has financial means or access to networks or um, other kinds of uh, resources may, of course, at least at a theoretical level, um, benefit the, the child, right? Because the person is able to transfer some of these resources to their stepchild. Similarly, looking at a socio-emotional pathway, um, a step-parent can, step can just as well as a, a, a biological parent play a role in the life of a child through simply being there, helping out with homework, and you know, providing a stable and, and, and a positive environment for the child. There are several reasons, though, why when looking at step families, um, <coughs> these mechanisms are a little bit more problematic. Um, because there are many different reasons why the transmission of resources may be less straightforward from step parent to stepchild um, than among biological children. One such theory is stress, stress theory, which typically emphasizes short-term effects of both divorce uh, or step-family formation, typically emphasizing the, um, the uh, disadvantages associated with uh, um, you know, having to 
move houses or move to different schools and stuff like and things like that 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 can happen as a consequence of of parents either divorcing and subsequently uh, meeting someone new or uh, marrying someone new. Um, another theory would be a, the, the role ambiguity theory or uh, a theory regarding role ambiguities uh, that is also easy I think at an intellectual or intuitive level to understand where um, both the step parent and the stepchild may have problems uh, really navigating relationships in new family formations. Um, as if we focus for a second on step parents, um, they may feel less attached to these step children than they would had they been had they been their own biological children, uh, which could influence their their willingness or their ability to transfer resources to that individual. Um, Focus, focusing on the child, uh, the child may struggle with conflicts, for example, between their biological parent and their step parent in terms of, uh, you know, conflicting feelings of loyalty and things like this, which may also negatively influence um, whatever transmission of resources that may actually that may otherwise have occurred. Theory has also suggested that the timing of step family formation may matter. Um, primarily linked to the child's developmental process, where children who are very young may be more accepting to a new parental figure. Um, and, I mean, everyone can also relate, you know, and think about when they were teenagers and they were uh, kind of um, um, being a little um, less than respectful towards their parents. Uh, this may also be a, uh, a period when, when the introduction of step, step parents may be particularly problematic, a period when, when the child is, is kind of uh, trying to uh, embark on uh, their own um, independent uh, you know, life trajectory. So the previous research, um, if we're looking at both divorce research and uh, into the consequences of step family formation, there is a literature, especially especially when it comes to the consequences of divorce. I would say that there's a rather large literature. Uh, the predominance of the research that has been done in this field is either how is however either based on retrospective survey data, or rather small longitudinal data sets or longitudinal data sets covering rather small populations. And when I'm talking about rather small populations, I'm talking a couple of thousand individuals. There are several problems with this that I will be getting back to uh, in a couple of slides. The literature that does exist on the consequences of step family formation uh, does tend to suggest that there, there's a predominance of negative effects. There's been some studies on, on the, the consequences for the kid in terms of the psychological well-being, suggesting negative effects. Uh, there's been research into the educational attainment of the child, as well as their adult, the, the child's own adulthood labor market outcomes, also suggesting um, a predominance of negative effects. But we don't know much. So I think it's fair to say that the current state of knowledge is uh, very fragmented and limited regarding the consequence of step family formation for the outcomes of, child, of the children that were affected. I think that part of this is due to an insufficient ability to properly model the relationships that are suggested by theory. For example, when it comes to exploring heterogeneities in terms of the timing and duration that the child is exposed to a certain uh, alternative family, form, uh, family type. Um, also, um, inabilities to properly explore heterogeneities when it comes to the resources um, that are brought into the family by the new parental figure. Um, for example, yeah, the introduction of step parents during certain ages may be problematic, but not in others. And uh, the characteristics may act as important moderators. And we really don't know much about this. And this is li linked to the data being um, unable to fully explore the mechanisms. So what I think is fair to say is that, the, uh, is that the, what we really need to understand this is longitudinal data uh, that allows us to examine when changes occur in family, um, family circumstances and how they subsequently influence outcomes. 
So this project focuses on Scandinavia, uh, and the results that I will show you today are very early, uh, but we're looking at a bunch of different outcomes. Uh, but the results are for Sweden. And uh, I think that there are certain uh, advantages to study in Sweden that I will mention in a second. Uh, and Sweden uh, was a uh, second demographic transition forerunner, uh, which means that Sweden experienced an early increase in, in both cohabitation, divorce, as well as non-marital child, uh, childbearing. All right? So a lot of the patterns that we see, or a lot of the things that we see in other developed countries today, Sweden was reasonably early uh, in experiencing these things. So one thing that's important when we're studying um, the effect of divorce and subsequent step family formation on the outcomes of the kid is of course, well, if there is a divorce, can we expect that, this? Can we expect that the child will be exposed to both parents? Because obviously if divorce means that the kid never sees their father, whether he goes on to marry someone new may be completely irrelevant. So, but Sweden has, since 1949, has uh, in place a law saying that joint custody of, ch of the child, of the children, uh, is the norm. Right? This does not necessarily, however, mean that the child will spend 50% 50 50 of the time with the father and 50% of the time with the mother. And again, when it comes to this, the kind of register data that we, that we uh, work with uh, doesn't contain this information, so we can't directly uh, look at the data and see uh, where the kid, or uh, whether the kid spends uh, equal time with the parents. There is survey data, and there has been, uh, well, there has been surveys uh, trying to understand to what extent uh, uh, this is the case, so that the kid spends time with both parents. And I think it's fair to say, or it's probable that that is the case. Um, uh, recent data suggests that, uh, that the large majority of children spend at least 50% of the time with their mothers, uh, whereas 40% of the ch children live um, with their father 50% of the time. So 60% of the children live with the father less than 50% of the time. With the majority of this share, however, seeing the father on a regular basis. All right, whatever that means, I don't actually know. but. Um, at least indicating that they have solid contact with their father. Another problem when it comes to examining whatever consequences of, uh, if we want, regardless if we look at the consequences of divorce or brief, uh, family reformation, is of course that these decisions made by the parent are of course to a large extent driven by unobserved characteristics. You know, certain people simply have a, uh, a, certain people have a tendency to choose partners less well than others, um, or to divorce or to leave their relationships more easily than others. So in other words, the people that we see in the data that end up divorcing and end up remarrying is not necessarily a, 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 a um, it's, not ran, it's not necessarily a random subset of the population. One thing that we saw in uh, the presentation here at, at, at the at MPC a couple of weeks ago um, is that one thing that could affect um, women's or ma males for that uh, matter um, propensity to remarry is of course economic factors. Right? So it could be that women or men, they choose to remarry sooner simply because they have to because of financial constraints. Uh, they can't afford to be single. right? I believe that Sweden is a reasonably good example or is a reasonably good case to study when it comes to this, simply because of the generous social security net that, is, uh, that exists in Sweden. So individuals, um, I believe, uh, have the ability to, um, to live alone with their children, simply because uh, childcare is available and very affordable, um, unemployment benefits are reasonably affordable, and so forth and so forth. So I think that this mechanism, or the kind of the um, the push towards remarrying soon, or just choosing whoever, just because uh, you have to, because of financial constraints, is less strong in Sweden than it would be in in the U.S., which I think is good. So the data that we use uh, for this study uh, is called the Swedish Interdisciplinary Panel. Uh, it's a longitudinal data sets 
uh, consisting of administrative register data for the Titan period, 1960. Yes. Um, sorry, do you want questions? Directly? Yes, go ahead. Or, or, or yeah, after? no, please. Um, so I'm wondering about, I mean, about the Swedish social safety net and yes. its um, relationship with, with remarriage. Mm -hmm. Would, um, so, so like we saw from, Ad from Adriana a couple weeks ago, that, which is what you're referring to, um, that was like being encouraged to remarry because it, it increases your, your economic um, <coughs> uh, resources, but could, does it work the other way in Sweden, where if you got remarried and your economic situation went up, you would actually lose a lot of that, those benefits? Like, would that could, could the safety net work as a, as discouraging remarriage? Um, I don't know anything about it. So. I don't think that's likely, um, because uh, the majority of the benefits are individual based okay. rather than family based. Okay. You know, one of the one of the things one of the big things when it comes to this uh, was taxation laws, for example. Okay where individual level taxation uh, replaced family level taxation uh, simply to give uh, okay. so women an incentive like to stay in the labor market and okay. so forth. Okay, cool. yeah. So nothing is, is contingent on marital status like the TANF program? Well the, well, the only thing would be that the there is, um, when it comes to childcare for example, uh -huh. that is, the fee is partly needs based. Okay. Um, so that's the only thing that I can think of from the top of my head. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want, I'm, your next slide that you were at mm -hmm. about what your sample was. Yes, mm -hmm. so I'm, I guess I'm surprised that you're using marriage versus marriage and cohabitation given that cohabitation is so strong yes. in Sweden. All right, let me, let me go over the slide and I'll address that. Okay, All right? thank you. Okay, yes. So, so um, yeah, so it's a database covering the entire period 1968 through 2012. We uh, look at a, a, our baseline sample are all individuals born between 1973 and 1985, right? We have a couple of conditions here. The first is that the biological parents are married <coughs> at the time of birth. The reason for that is that this is the only way that we can link individuals to their biological parents. All right. That's a real subset. <laughs> it is a subset. Yes, it is. And that's also the reason why we're studying Denmark as well. Because in Denmark we have cohabitation. So that's, that's one of the reasons. Yes. So what fraction of kids born between these cohorts were born to married versus cohabiting couples? Do you know that? About 60% were born to married couples. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it is a subset. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, so, and the reason why they have to be married also at the time of birth here is because otherwise they wouldn't be as at risk of experiencing parental divorce. Uh, but yes, but that's something that we address, that we will address with the Danish data. Um, so marriage dissolution, um, we've gotten rid of the kids whose marriage dis dissolution occurs because of parental death. Uh, the reason for this is because of you know, again, the, the role ambiguity theory and so forth, we think that that would be, that that's less strong if it's, uh, if remarriage occurs following a parent dying, right? Simply because... Is that as, a, as an alternative treatment? Possibly. Um, possibly, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have, yeah, we've thought about that, but haven't really, yeah. Um, no biological parents can have missing information on educational attainment. That's a minor thing. If the parents divorce, either biological parent may only marry one time during the follow-up period. Right? The reason for this is because otherwise uh, we run into problems when it comes to how do we model exposure to step-parents. How do we model the timing of exposure to a step-parent as well as the duration of exposure to a step-parent. Fortunately, uh, experiencing multiple remarriages is a very uncommon phenomenon. So that is not a big deal either in terms of sample selection, we think. Mm -hmm. Lastly, we've limited the sample to biological parents who are in heterosexual relationships, both initially, obviously, uh, when the child in question was born, as well as subsequently. Right? So those are the sample. Uh, selection criteria. Our individuals are followed from birth and until experiencing <coughs> the event in question that I will be get, getting to shortly uh, or censoring. All right. 
so we look at, so, so there are a few things. So the good news about this talk is that you're getting some results that you didn't expect. Because I only, the, 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 um, the uh, title on the, um, on the poster was only to look at educational outcomes. So you get a little bit more. <laughs> the downside is that the results are still, it's still at a very early stage. However, I do feel that given that we know very little about this, uh, looking at a little bit more descriptive patterns does actually serve a purpose. But, so we will be looking at five different outcomes. We will be performing a, a cross-sectional analysis on ninth grade GPA. Um, so that is at age 15, 16. Fif the age, the, it's during the year the individual turns 16. Uh, we will have, we will also conduct longitudinal analysis uh, using, I will only show you the results for the logit discrete time duration analysis, but we also have run Cox proportional hazards models. The results don't change on four different outcomes. First, uh, seeking medical attention for psychological problem. All right. Uh, it's been hypothesized that experiencing uh, these events are problematic or may be problematic to the child and could lead to um, psychological issues. So that's what we're looking at. We code that through ICD-10, the F codes, and, and ICD-9 codes, uh, 290 through 319. We also look at seeking med medical attention for self-harm behavior, uh, so essentially suicide attempts. Fortunately, this is a very uncommon occurrence, um, but we do nevertheless uh, look at that as well. Uh, we'll look at both these outcomes in the age range 13 to 25. Rob? Do you have death codes? We do, yeah. Why not include actual suicide? We actually ran suicide as a separate outcome. Uh -huh. uh, they are so few, so we didn't, get any, uh, real, we didn't get any results there. But I think that it could be a, an idea to, to merge them. Yes? Can you say um, a bit about the how this um, data set was generated? Mm -hmm. One of the I guess a couple of things that are a little surprising to me is my sense is that there is um, quite a bit of concern about confidentiality of data in Scandinavian countries. And um, some of your outcome variables are things that, you know, in US data, for example, would be considered really sensitive, mm -hmm. like the suicidality or self harm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Can, if you could give a little more information about how this came to be, who gets access to it. Yeah. So, so h how you get access to it, it's, it's basically based on a, a, a rather broad um, uh, ethics approval, you know, where this, mm -hmm. is an, uh, this is under an ethics approval that looks at essentially early life shocks and or early life conditions and how that looks, uh, affects later life health and socioeconomic outcomes. Um, so obviously all data are, um, are, are de-identified. Um, so there's no way, well, there's essentially no way to identify the people in question. Um, and when I'm saying that, I'm lying a little bit, because of course, if you know a lot about a certain person, you could, you know, you could find them. Um, that is illegal to, it's illegal to try to find a person. Um, so essentially it's, um, but the data itself is from the hospital discharge registers. Um, so when it comes to both these medical outcomes is both from the inpatient register, which is, which requires that you are actually, you actually spend a night at the hospital, as well as from the outpatient register, which doesn't require hospitalization. And was the, um, was the funding for creating this data set, you know, was this uh, from the national government? Was it from, you know, something like, do we consider NIH? Was it, you know, sort of, University um, researchers. Or yeah, I think it. Yeah. I think the the research, the funding for this data, comes from the Swedish Research Council, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks. But I think I mean I. Those are I mean yes. It, and that's kind of why I also said you know thankfully there are so few because it's it, it, it makes me a little uncomfortable to even look at these things, but I do think <coughs> that it's relevant uh, because it's you know there's a there's a potential pathway I think between the the the, um, the things that we're looking at and the outcome in question. So yeah, but yes. Okay, so um, so between the ages of 13 and 25, both these medical outcomes. Uh, we also look at two demographic outcomes. 
uh, which is the first marriage, uh, as well as the individual's transition to parenthood. Okay, and both of these, well, one is age 18 to 25, and transition to parenthood 15 uh, through 25. Um, when it comes to the medical conditions, uh, we observe people continuously, so year by year, uh, until they are age 25. Whereas when it comes to first marriage and transition to parenthood, individuals are obviously censored when they experience the in event in question. Okay? <coughs> Yes. Yes. Sorry, I was just um, wondering if there was the possibility to explore other outcomes like um, that are more symptomatic of risky behavior. Um, I don't know the use of um, automobiles by, um, by, by adolescents in this context, but being things like car accidents, um, overdoses, things that are, that are not unintentional, but yeah. that are not intentional. That that, might yeah, no, those, I mean, things like that would be there, but again, conditional, essentially conditional on you being hospitalized for it. So if you're in a car accident and you're hospitalized, we should have it because we have not only, you know, one diagnosis, we have the, the main diagnosis and uh, a bunch of supplementary diagnoses. So they should be there, yes, yes. Um, those might be a little bit more common than suicide attempts or Possibly, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? No. All right. <coughs> okay, so the, the key independent variables here, um, just so we fully understand, are, are two variables essentially. One is a dichotomous variable indicating whether individual I, at the time T, at time T, have been exposed to divorce or stepfather or stepmother. So three different variables essentially. Prior to what time? No, at that time. So, so essentially, you're f I'm, you follow me from when I'm 15. So I have one observation at age 15, mm -hmm. one at 16, 17, 18, and so forth. So essentially, at each year, we have a variable saying, have my parents divorced? Yes, no. But before 15? Or after that. Okay. Okay, yeah. So that's the first, that's the, the very simple way of measuring it. So that would be the same regardless of if your parents divorced when you were three, or if they divorced it when you were 14. You would have the same value at, at age 15, okay? The other variable measures, tries to measure the timing or try to gauge more the relevance of timing, <coughs> all right? Uh, it's a fully flexible specification measuring how many years have you been exposed to divorced parents, a stepfather, or a stepmother. So in other words, for the, when I'm age 15, if my parents divorced when I was 13, let, well, let's change it. If my parents divorced when I was five, and my mother remarried when, she, when I was 10, I would have had 10 years of exposure to divorce and five years of exposure to a stepfather, which would increase as we follow me over time. All right? Yes? Do you know who their primary place of residence is with, with which parent for the divorce case? No, but that's also, that's also I would be coming back to that uh, later, but that's something that we aim to explore by um, looking at uh, so because we know where the we know where the child lives, mm -hmm. right? Or in which municipality. So what we can do is that we can look at, say, uh, say in this case, for example, if we're here in Ramsey County, where I live, um, let's say that the kid lives in Ramsey County, the mother lives in Ramsey County, and the father lives out on the East Coast, right? In, that, in, in such a situation, we would know that the kid lives with the mother and probably has reasonably limited exposure to the father. So we're going to do some sensitivity analysis we, we, where we look at things like that. Is it county level data or parish level data? It's municipality level yes. data. So it's in between. Yeah. Okay. So this is how the sample, uh, this are, these are very basic uh, sample uh, characteristics. Looking at these different outcomes, GPA, marriage, childbearing, psychological problems, self-harm behavior. Um, so you see that the uh, number of individuals that we're looking at, is, is, it's a pretty large sample. It's over 700,000 individuals. Um, for the longitudinal analysis, you see that we have many more observations simply because we follow individuals over time. So we have repeated observations. Um, because of marriage, childbearing, psychological problems, self-harm behavior, we observe individuals until they're 25. A larger proportion of the parents 
uh, a larger proportion of the individuals have parents that divorce, right? So if we compare GPA, which is at age 15, 14% 14 of the parents have divorced, <coughs> whereas when we follow the individuals until they're 25, almost twice the amount, uh, or twice the share, the, double the chair, share uh, of parents have divorced, all right? Uh, you see that uh, we have 2% experienced stepfather and stepmother by the age 15, and here you see the corresponding numbers when we are uh, able to follow the individuals over time. Mm -hmm. So I can say again, um, I don't remember who brought it up, but the, yes, I think it was Phyllis about uh, cohabitation. When we compare our numbers to the Danish data, we get roughly twice the amount when we include, um, when we include the, the cohabiting parents. If I have a, both a stepmother and a stepfather, is that a different category or you just include each? We look at them separately. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is just, this is not the prettiest graph that you'll ever see, but this is just kind of tells you our distribution of these different uh, transitions over the life course of the child. So this is the age of the individual and the percent of observed events. So essentially looking at divorce, the very few divorces, no divorces at age zero, because that's by construction. At age one, we have about 1% of the observed divorces, and uh, then it increases and remain rather stable over the life course. So I don't really have a point with this graph just to kind of show you that these, these events occur all over the, over the observed life course. Um, so we talked before about the resources in step families. And um, so this is again a, a very simple, um, but it shows you how that we have quite a bit of educational mobility, if you will, uh, when we're comparing biological mothers <coughs> to stepmothers and biological fathers to stepfathers. All right. Um, the diagonal are those who are immobile, which means that, for example, among parents who remarry, so 22% of fathers who remarry uh, who had, a, who had a, a primary educated wife will again marry someone with primary education. So the green indicates uh, the upwardly mobile, if, we, if you will. Can you uh, give us a, a little more context about um, education or detail about education in Sweden? Like, how much is primary school there? Um, yeah. Is, does, uh, if I'm a, a Swedish child who wants to go to college, to what extent am I? Um, dependent on family resources versus states. Support. Absolutely. Yes. So uh, primary education is the first nine years of elementary school. Secondary is the subsequent three years of high school here, I guess. And then you have shorter university, which are, which are degrees that are less than master. And then you have master education and, and above. <coughs> I am recently sure here. And do, how long are people legally mandated? to attend school? Like, um, can they drop out at the end of primary if they want to? They can, but it's very uncommon. Yeah. So, but in, uh, in terms of resources, um, so schooling is free um, through, you know, a PhD. It's, everything is free. Uh, and people are incentivized to study through um, loans and um, transfers from the government. Uh, so I believe from when you're 15, you get um, you get a monthly allowance simply for studying, and in addition to that, you can take out a loan from the government to essentially finance your, you know, apartment, living in an apartment, and so forth. So, can I do a, mm -hmm. a follow-up yeah. question to that? So, um, if you were instead looking at the United States, yes. where schooling is not free. Yes. Um, you know, I would think that a, a major route for the influence of family structure would be financial resources. But in, in the Swedish case, where schooling is free, is the, um, is the uh, effect of you know, family structure on uh, educational attainment going to be much more in terms of, I don't know, social support and you know, I don't know, parental pressure to achieve or whatever. Yeah. Can yeah. we kind of take the financial out of that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> I would definitely say that that's the case. It's more, um, 
I mean, I came from, I'm, I'm born and raised in Lund, which is uh, like one of the two big university right. cities. And I know that basically everyone in my high school class, they went on to study some at the university, uh, which you don't see in the smaller towns in the countryside or, you know. So it's very, it's the social pressure, the social, you know, that's, it's very strong. Which right. brings yes. me to the question of, on the left-hand side, there's probably very few of the mothers in primary. Uh, there are reasonably few, uh, but um, do we know? Not terribly few. Yeah, I sh well. Like the uh, percent. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't have it here, but it's at least fifty. I think it's like fifteen percent. <gasps> really. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it's like fifteen in the primary, around forty in secondary, and then. Um, yeah, okay. at least today it could be a little bit less at this time because these are, after all, you know, parents of children born between yeah. seventy-three and eighty-five. Yeah, yeah. So just, I mean, the, the numbers themselves aren't very informative. The only thing that kind of that I found recently interesting to point out is that upward mobility seems to be more common among the uh, the men, so that they marry upwards. Uh, so they're the woman who they marry after the, the initial marriage uh, has higher educational attainment and of, of course the opposite when it comes to the women. Anyway, I need to get to the results now um, <laughs> and I have quite some slides. All right, so anyway, so here we have just survivor con uh, curves. So this essentially just shows you these are, you know, obviously without any covariates, so these just raw patterns in the data. Or, um, and a few interesting things here. First of all, maybe I should have put this these up uh, but when we're looking at psychiatric illness and self-harm behavior, there's really no difference between having been exposed to divorce and uh, divorce and subsequently step family formation, um, which came as a little bit of a, a, a surprise to me, um, because step family formation is, is viewed as you know potentially being problematic. But you see absolutely no, essentially no difference between these curves. But what we do see is that. Uh, uh, a more frequent transition or sooner transition to these uh, adverse outcomes among children of divorce and and or step family formation. Looking at their di demographic behavior, um, looking at marriage, we see that it seems to be divorce that is kind of off-putting for the kids, which you know in a way kind of makes sense. If my parents divorce, uh, I think I would be less likely or. The, the, the idea of marrying my, of getting married myself is probably a little bit less. Uh, but if one of my parents goes on and marries someone else and is happy again, maybe, maybe that increases my likelihood to get married. At least that's what these very, very simple graphs show you. Childbearing. Um, the, the highest childbearing propensities here are among those experiencing step families. Um, the discrepancy here between the marriage curve and the childbearing curve, I have a kind of hard time wrapping my head around what that really tells us, but that's, that's, that's how it is. All right, so some baseline regression model, looking at all the outcomes. And again, uh, so if you just listen, listen for a second and then we'll go through the different graphs here. So what we're looking at here for marriage are odds ratios, okay? And the independent variable in question, be it divorce, stepfather, or stepmother, is simply whether an individual at that time has experienced this transition. So in other words, uh, an individual who has experienced their parents divorcing, um, and again, holding you know, age constant uh, and a bunch of other uh, control variables at the individual level, uh, will experience a, a statistically significant lower probability of marrying themselves, all right? So the odds ratio is about 0.8. So it's quite, the, quite, a, quite a substantial uh, uh, association. Experiencing stepfather and or stepmother or, or stepmother increases the probability of marriage, all right? Which again is kind of consistent with, with what I said before, you, um, suggested before. Um, what's the excluded group here at all three of those specifications? That would be people with parents who are still married. Okay, in all yeah. three of them? Yes, okay. in all three of them, yes, exactly. So that's the overall reference category, all right? So, yes. 
Looking at childbearing, we see again that this um, pattern where all three of these transitions uh, are increasing the probability of early childbearing. It needs to be emphasized again that we're looking at early childbearing here again before the age of 25. And these don't include any covariates? Yes, they do. They include age, uh, the educational level of the parents, the educational level of, of uh, step parents if they have any, um, yeah, and a bunch of other. All right? Um, psychological problems, or if we turn to the health issues, uh, these are quite interesting, I think, because both when it comes to psychological problems and self-harm behavior, we find nothing when it comes to the effect of step family formation or the introduction of step father or stepmother. Uh, these coefficients are very close to, or these odds ratios are very close to one, and they're both statistically insignificant. The the positive effects are instead, or the positive associations are instead attributable to um, the experience of divorce. So that's what triggers this, that's what seems to be triggering this, uh, this adversity in terms, of, uh, in terms of health. The same, um, or at least the same pattern, is when it comes to the GPA, and this is standardized <coughs> GPA, and we're looking at OLS here, uh, where um, experiencing divorce lowers the individual's standardized GPA by almost 30% of a standard deviation, which is quite, large, uh, quite a large effect. Um, there's an additional negative effect from stepfather uh, or stepmother, but it's uh, not as, uh, nowhere near the S1. All right. Um, okay, so I have too much and I want to leave time for questions. Uh, so let's see what I want to point out here. So again, what I said before is that the, one of the hypotheses that is that timing matters, right? Um, so is, are these experiences, are they, are they something that uh, are associated with adversity you know, right after they occur? Or is this something that is lingering for a long time? Uh, something that I believe that we know very little about. So the next specification, instead of looking just at whether the person has experienced divorce, we look at the time, the number of years since the person experienced this event, okay? So what we need to focus here on is the line around one, okay? That's the key, all right? So if we start with marriage here, what we see is that the, during the year or up to one year after the parent, the parent's divorce, it has a, a statistically insignificant effect on whether the child themselves divorce which I think makes perfect sense. Let's say that I decide tomorrow that I'm gonna get married. I'm gonna get married in six months. If my mother calls me tomorrow and says that, hey, uh, dad and I are getting divorced, that's probably not gonna influence my immediate short-term plans. However, after that, you see a statistically significant and you know, non-trivial effect that seems to be lingering over the entire time period that we can observe here. All right, so it seems to be a very, a, 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 a non-trivial and lingering negative effect from divorce. The same when it comes to childbearing, and even more so when it comes to psychological problems. Again, this is just psychological problems. This is not the self-harm behavior, just the psychological problems. Where we, where we even see this increasing disadvantage or increasing prevalence of, or probability of being um, um, seeking medical attention for psychological problems, which I found um, a little bit surprising that this is something that actually grows stronger the longer it's been. All right. Looking at the same, but for step parent introduction, we see that we have separate effects here for stepfather and stepmother with reasonably moderate or insignificant effects when it comes to the effect of step parent introduction on the kid's propensity to marry. Essentially the same when it comes to childbearing, but one thing that's interesting to note is that we have a, a positive effect only from stepfather, but nothing from stepmother essentially. But again, the effects are not, um, are not, are not affected, are not uh, estimated uh, extremely robustly. This is interesting too. There's no effect on psychological problems from step-parent introduction whatsoever. So this, what we saw on psychological problems seems to be entirely driven by exposure to divorce 
and much less so by being introduced to step parents. This is the last slide before the conclusions because I want to have time for questions. But looking at the, st the step parental resources, the, the influence of step parental resources, here measured through the educational attainment of the step parent, we see rather uh, essentially results that could be that, that we could expect. So essentially, uh, we see a gradient by the educational attainment of the step parent where, for example, when it comes to marriage among the children, uh, having a step parent with only primary education increases your risk of marrying, increases the risk of the child of marrying, whereas having highly educated step parents reduces that risk. Right? So if we look at ma early marriage and childbearing as kind of indicators of a little bit of maybe not the most responsible behavior, especially when it comes to early childbearing, I think, um, we see the expected effect that, the, that, the, that if you are introduced to a step-parent, the more educated that they are, the more beneficial in terms of reducing the risk of experiencing this event. We see again, as could be expected, very little when it comes to socio uh, psychological and self-harm behavior, uh, consistent with the previous graph, and quite strong effects when it comes to the GPA. All right. Uh, so ha again, having a step mother with a PhD or a university education will increase, or is here uh, associated with uh, over a 10 percent or 12 to 16 percent of a standard deviation higher GPA among the child, or with, uh, for the child. All right, so this was a lot of results. Um, so let me try to summarize it. So the consequences of, expose, uh, of exposure to parental divorce are clearly long-lasting, more long-lasting than uh, we expected to find, or at least I expected to find. Um, and I think that this is, uh, this is definitely a, a new finding, something that we haven't seen before. And in the case of health outcomes, this even seems to be worsening over time. Um, on psychiatric influence, this influence from parental divorce is indeed quite substantial. Um, staying on the health outcomes, the influence of the step parents seems to be very, very marginal. In terms of the demographic behavior, uh, influence of divorce is robust over the ages examined. Uh, but when it comes to the influence of the step-parents, this seems to be more strongly driven by the stepfather rather than the stepmother. Um, I believe that there may be some, some theoretically uh, uh, appealing um, explanations, but I don't have one right now. For GPA, smaller but negative baseline effects of step-parents um, compared to the association with divorce. The resources of the step-parents matter. High educational attainment is linked to postponing marriage and childbearing as well as better school performance. So, a future work, a lot more and more focused work on more appropriately capturing these mechanisms that I talked about initially uh, is something that we will be prioritizing. As well as we will be trying to estimate sibling fixed effect models to, to try to get rid of some of this unobserved heterogeneity at the parental level in terms of certain parents having certain um, predispositions towards partner choice and divorce. Again, hopefully it wasn't too overwhelming, too much results, but that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if you had been giving this paper in the United States, I wonder if um, it might have been framed a little differently in terms of um, uh, that well, if you're divorced, but you don't take on a second marital partner, you're a single parent. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm I'm wondering um, if uh, one way to well one to sort of acknowledge that the people who are you know kids growing up, um, the the product of divorce, but not with a step parent, are in fact in single parent families unless. You know, you're not maybe mm. picking up the cohabitors, so maybe they're not really, you know, without two adults in the household. But um, I'm wondering if some of the um, some of the not negative effect of uh, having a step parent is just that you have a second 
mm -hmm. parent in the home. And again, this isn't so much a questioning of your results as just sort of noting that like, I don't know, if you were a, uh, an American researcher giving American data, mm -hmm. that's probably one of the terms that would have come up and which really didn't come up in, okay. in your talk. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I think one of the reasons, if I'm fully understanding, is, is that um, there's, since there's been quite a bit of work on the consequences of divorce, I've been trying to, or we've been trying to focus quite, you know, a, a, a lot on just the characteristics of the step parents and introduction of that and so forth. Right. So maybe it was, you know, maybe it could be framed a little bit different still, but that's kind of where we want to keep the focus. Right. Yeah. yeah. Just basically saying, like, you know, there's the stress with the, with the, um, with you know, getting in a new parent. Yes. But that a, a counter to that may be that, like, you're getting in a new parent. Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Can Can you separate the effect of the uh, step parent education from the uh, education of the parent that was lost? Because you showed how. So yes. Are at the yeah. Level that's, and yeah. Are yeah. That's exactly what one of these things that we want to do, uh, to more explicitly look at this kind of educational mobility experienced by the parents. So, do the kids benefit if the new, the new parental figure, so to speak, has more resources compared to the previous one, uh, compared to their biological parent? And we have, uh, we're going to look at other things than education as well. I mean, we're going to look at like, lifetime earnings and things like this instead. Um, although, again, given that um, you know, access to education and so forth, as well as healthcare, is less driven by economic resources in Sweden than it is in the US, we, wouldn't, we don't expect you know, that to differ so much uh, from, from our effects on education. But still, it's something that we want to look at. Yeah? So I think this is a real conservative analysis of the impact of, of divorce because your, your negative effects of divorce is in a country where 40% are seeing both parents, there's not an economic pre, pre, uh, loss, and that you still find this. I hope it, when you write it that you really emphasize that mm -hmm. that's kind of surprising. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's Or I think And that's also the effects of a step you know, on the psychological well-being or whatever it was of, of uh, having a step-parent or step-father, um, you know, that too, because the parent, the father, is still in the picture, mm -hmm. unlike in the U.S. Yeah. So I guess I'm saying that this is a more stringent test than would be in the United States, where you have such <coughs> heterogeneity. But I, I also want to add a question is, for the outcomes, you're looking, did they marry? For the outcome, maybe you could look at a, a multinomial outcome of didn't marry, cohabit, mm. or, or, yes. or marry. Yes, yes. And I think another thing about that is we look at childbearing and marriage. It would be interesting to look at uh, outside, I mean, childbearing outside marriage. Yeah. I think that's... Uh, that would be an even stronger measurement of like irresponsible or like yes. if we want to call it irresponsible behavior. But, but you have to look at the cohabiting because if they're cohabiting, it's not irresponsible. Yes. Right? No. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk about the decision to cut things off at twenty five? Yes. Is that, is that a data limitation? Yeah. Or? Yeah. We want to. Yeah. We want to follow each cohort for throughout okay. the entire um, you know age span that we're looking at. So okay. that's that's the reason. Okay. Yeah. Behind there? Um, Julia. So I had a question about the interpretation of the um, duration. So you, yes. you were saying that the, uh, specifically the psychological distress yes. measure, and you were, you were seeing yeah. um, non-statistically significant results in the um, fewer years since divorce, and then more at 25. Y yeah. Uh, uh, no, they're, they're all statistically significant. All it's the size of them. So here, down here is the, you know, this is null effect. If, you ha if the confidence intervals would overlap with one, that would be a null effect. Mm -hmm. so, but, so essentially what it says is that if your parents divorced the year prior, during the previous 365 days essentially, your risk of experiencing psychological problems would be, or your, the odds would be about 50% higher. But if it's, 
you know, 20 years, 20 years before, then it's over 100% iron. Right, and so I guess my question was more about, is this about a duration or about timing? Because it seems like yeah. what you're capturing here in the, in the later years is yeah. um, the fact that this like then the divorce likely happened when they sure. were very young. Yes. And yes. that maybe explains more of that that bigger effect? Yes. No, absolutely. And that's that's one of the struggles. I, I don't know how to if we can separate between essentially timing and duration because they're, you know, the flip side of the same coin. I mean so you fully interacted the models with age? Oh yeah, they've yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. wouldn't that, I mean, wouldn't that be where you capture Well, oh, you mean uh, interacting age with, exp uh, with, with the, duration? With the, yeah. No, we didn't do that. Okay, Not because I imagine yeah. that would allow you to parse that out. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a good idea. Yeah. Time for one last quick question. Dave? Did you yeah, sure. Um, I had the opposite reaction as Phyllis, thinking that it wasn't very conservative because that last bullet point I think was essential. There's, there's supposed to be huge selection biases in here, the people who remarry, or, you know, in terms of the, the indicators that you're looking at and just the pressure on the need to, to do that because those who can remarry have certain unobserved characteristics that you're not, not capturing otherwise. Yeah, but I think, uh, I think given that, for example, here in the U.S., I mean, if I, I, I assume that being a single mother uh, who works a reasonably low-paying job uh, making ends meet with having a couple of kids is very difficult. So I think you would be strongly incentivized because of the way things are here to, to you remarry. know, try to find a, 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 a another you know, a, another breadwinner for the family. Right. Whereas those incentives are less strong in Sweden mm -hmm. because, you know, if, if you don't make a lot of money, you have very, you know, housing assistance and, you know, various things that will, you know, you'll get by. Okay. So, yeah. But it's, but it, but there's more work to be done, definitely yeah. about kind of d disentangling and figuring out what how the mechanisms. Yeah, the selection in the marriage market, yes. I think, must be play a huge market. Oh yeah, model. absolutely. And that's you know the sibling models will take care of part of that, yeah. but it's I mean this will never be a costal this will never be a costal project. This is this are going these are going to be associations, but still. So. On that note. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.